County Executive Johnny L, thanks for joining us. My pleasure. Tell me why you wanted to run for another term this time around. Well, you know, four years ago, Baltimore County was at a crossroads. And in the, in the four years since, we have made this government more open, accessible, and transparent than ever before. We've invested historic dollars in public safety and our schools. And we've really focused laser like on quality of life issues. And so we have raised the bar, um, but I think now we've got a great foundation from which to build. Really, um, it's my hope that if I'm fortunate enough to have another term that we can build on those successes in the years ahead. What are some of the goals that you're looking for to accomplish if, if elected? We, we've worked really hard these past four years to, for example, put forward both record shattering funding for school construction, but also mm -hmm. to obtain a lot of money from the state to help uh, uh, really accomplish those aims. So we now are, we broke ground on a new Lansdowne High School in the Southwest. We have uh, planning and design money for new high schools uh, at Lansdowne and Delaney, uh, like new school at Towson. Uh, we have, we're in the stages of doing overcrowding solutions for the Northeast and Southeast, uh, a career and technology school uh, on the west side of the county, uh, a new Scotts Branch Elementary School. We cut ribbons on uh, other new uh, elementary schools throughout, throughout the term. So really for me, um, just continuing and sustaining that work. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's what this is all about. Talking about schools, we've <coughs> seen a lot of video surfacing of violence happening yeah. in schools. How do you plan to address that? And what do you think is the root cause? Yeah, so you know, I come at this as first and foremost a parent. Mm -hmm. You know, I have a daughter who's in our county school system. I'm a pub public school parent, in addition to being a county executive, in addition to having taught in our school system uh, and having been a student in the school system. So it's very personal for me, and keeping our kids safe is one of our most sacred responsibilities. Um, you know, in addition to the record funding that we're doing to have over three billion dollars for uh, construction and infrastructure work. We've put more rec more funding forward than any prior administration in the county's history. So even as we've seen enrollment uh, drops and, and dips, we've hired more teachers. We've hired more social workers and counselors and pupil personnel workers. We've supported the hiring of additional safety assistants in the school. We not only have maintained our support for our nationally recognized school resource officer program, we've actually expanded that. So in terms of the resources that the county can provide, um, we really are, are doing both sort of the accountability measures of mm -hmm. keeping our kids safe, but also some of the upstream work of lower class sizes, support thing, support personnel like, like counselors. I think that has to be coupled with accountability. And so for violent behavior and especially for repeat violent behavior, mm -hmm. um, you know, children have to know there are consequences to that behavior. And so um, that really is a function of the school board and the school administration. So. Um, you know, we continue to call on for, call on that from our school leadership to make sure that they are, um, you know, we're providing the supports, again, both the upstream and the safety interventions that we can from a county perspective, but that the school system um, is, you know, holding children and families accountable for violent behavior. What more could they be doing, the school board? Well, you know, look, as a, as a teacher, the thing I can tell you is that um, children that were persistently violent or disruptive not only uh, affected their own ability to learn, and those children are entitled to a, a chance to learn. But in doing so, they were also disrupting the opportunity for other, other children in the schoolhouse to right. um, have an education. It was disrupting my ability as a teacher um, to perform uh, my job and to deliver that education to the rest of the class. So uh, if someone is particularly violent or persistently violent, we have virtual options, we have alternative schools. And frankly, you know, taking, sometimes taking that student out of those situations where they are acting violently and aggressively gives us an opportunity to provide um, more intentionally those wraparound services for that student. And it's also often better for uh, the classroom and for the teacher. Is that not happening right now? You know, I, I, again, I, I don't know. You have to look sort of school by school and, and system wide mm -hmm. um, in terms of the, the data and what's happening. Uh, what we know is that numbers, according to the school system, are down. Uh, I think what's harder to know is when actions aren't taken, right? right? So we know the number of suspensions, we know expulsions, we know transfers. Uh, but what's harder to know is sort of the numbers that aren't, aren't acted upon. And how that's can, anecdotal from teachers and right. it's hard to quantify. So if elected, again, how can you take your position? You said you've called on the school to do more and mm -hmm. to, to focus on this, but is there anything else that you can do if you're providing the resources and it's really in the school board's hands, what more can you do about it? Well, just as we've done with the school bus challenge, right? We have used both the, the office and the microphone that comes with being county executive to keep bringing light um, yeah. to the issue. 
and also to use our ability to budget to help provide solutions. So on the school bus issue, we have significantly raised pay for school bus drivers and attendants. We stepped in as a county to do a lot of the pre-employment stuff with um, things like paying for pre-health uh, scans and fingerprinting. So we've helped clear a backlog. We've helped pay our drivers more. And uh, you know every system is struggling to, on some level, but really in Baltimore County, I'm proud of the progress we've made on things like school buses. So until uh, we're at a, a level where families are comfortable, we're gonna keep being at the table, mm -hmm. um, looking for solutions for um, any challenge in our community, whether it's in our schools or in the community, uh, certainly it, within neighborhoods outside of the school system, we have a lot more direct control, yeah. um, but that doesn't mean we're not going to try. When you're out campaigning, what are you hearing from voters as some of their biggest concerns? You know, again, I think we hear from voters, they're very happy that they feel like they have access to this government. Mm -hmm. We have opened up in a way that's really unique to Baltimore County. It was very insular before, and we've really tried to turn government inside out. Why was that important? You know, c transparency and accountability drives progress. And I think what we do is just as important as how we do it. Mm -hmm. And so both from the structures of government, so it's the, the town hall forums we have where thousands of residents have come out, both online and virtually, to tell us directly what they want. We have our um, spending and our budget is online down mm -hmm. to the check. Residents can see where their dollars are going. Uh, we've created the, the county's first ever office of the inspector general. I've grown it every year since being in office. We've passed uh, the first ever campaign finance reform, I think, in the county's history, where we're opening up opportunities in the years ahead for more people to have access to run and be successful. So, you know, I think that foundation, coupled with how we do it sort of with our governing partners, yeah. um, you know, we are common sense. We are reach across the aisle. We're solutions focused, not partisanship focused. Um, and you know, I'm really proud that almost everything we've done in Baltimore County has been a 7-0 or 6-1 vote, even though we have a very split council, four to three, four Democrats, three Republicans. And we've, we've collectively found ways to put progress above uh, partisanship, and we've really focused on issues. And I'm proud that you know, we've bipartisanly fixed um, issues and addressed issues like gun violence. We've mm -hmm. passed gun legislation in Baltimore County, like Democrats and Republicans coming together to do common sense gun reform. I want to talk about crime because yeah. that's obviously an issue. Uh, we see it happening in the city and we're seeing it happening at, really at everywhere. But especially in the county, there's been a lot of conversation about some frustration within the police department. And I know you went and talked to some folks in the police department. What are you hearing from members, rank and file members about what's going on? Well, I'll start by saying, you know, anyone who's affected by crime we care about and one person who's impacted is one too many. Mm -hmm. um, but what I can tell residents of Baltimore County is this is an incredibly safe place to live, work and raise a family. As you point out, crime is spiking all over the country, but that's actually not the case in most instances in Baltimore County. This year, homicides are actually down about 50% year to date. Last year, our violent part one crime was down about 16%. It's trending flat overall, and there are several key categories where it's down again this year, year over year. Um, so I'm proud of what we're doing in the, in the public safety space, um, both investing tens of millions of dollars more in our police department and doing those upstream interventions, things mm -hmm. like domestic violence prevention, mental health, that sort of all those wraparounds that help keep our community safe. Um, I also just think generally listening to our employees is a really good idea. Mm -hmm. uh, it's something I was intentional about before the pandemic struck. And so I used to go out to firehouses and roll calls and talk to um, our departments before. And now I'm just getting back into that. So had a real um, great time talking to uh, many roll calls throughout just sort of randomly visited police departments. Uh, we also opened up specific roundtables to allow Mm -hmm. officers who weren't randomly selected, I guess, to have a chance to come and talk to their uh, county executive. And, you know, we heard that people are very proud of this department. It has a long history of keeping our community safe, of excellence, and folks want to continue that, as, as do I. And so there are, I think, some, both some short-term and long-term things that we can be addressing, uh, not just salary and pay, but also issues of equipment and our, um, our, our police precincts bringing those up to speed. The buildings themselves? The buildings themselves. Um, there are issues of, of carryover leave, you know, like mm -hmm. most departments, we could 
you know, we have uh, vacancies. If anyone's interested in coming to work for Baltimore County, we'd love to have you. But as folks work more time, you know, allowing them to have more opportunities to carry over their leave days mm -hmm. that don't get used. Some of it's, you know, common sense things that we are actively working on and hope to have announcements in the coming weeks. Uh, some of it's longer term and more structural. You know, there was a 2007 change between uh, in healthcare for people who were hired before and after 2007, long before my tenure. Mm -hmm. But that, that divide is pretty significant. And so while on things like the, the drop or the deferred retirement um, opportunities, which we actually brought back um, during our administration, the healthcare challenges were sort yeah. of looming and out there. And they're very, very expensive, very complicated, but it's my commitment to tackle those. It's what we always try to do. We identify those challenges and we try to find solutions together. We hear a lot of uh, vocal criticisms from some people. The FOP often talks about the vacancies. How do you <coughs> approach that? How do you solve that problem? Because it's not just happening in Baltimore County. You, you're competing with vacancies in Baltimore yeah. City and surrounding jurisdictions. Yeah, I think we first recognize that this is uh, a national problem, uh, being, in, being a first responder in mm -hmm. general, but being a police officer in particular has always been a very difficult profession. I think that's been particularly true the last few years. So we, we listen, and that's part of why uh, we had police departments and our police officers as among the first agencies we started visiting again, mm -hmm. because we know that the uh, vacancies are acute and they affect our ability to keep our community safe. Although, again, even with the vacancies, we have really strong numbers about public safety here in Baltimore County. But listen to those doing the work. Um, so in addition to some of the issues we, we talked about, Things like a take-home car program are very appealing to people to be in patrol and how to recruit and retain officers. We put money in our budget for a pilot program. What I heard overwhelmingly is they want to see that expanded into an actual program. So we're looking at ways to fund that and make that real. How do you do that? Where's the money coming from? Well, you know, we have to be creative, uh, right? So there's, there's federal stimulus funding that we can use for any number of public safety purposes. Uh, there's repurposing money that's saved because of some of the vacancies. So we're looking at all the options to say, uh, you know, we've never been one to say we just can't do it. Mm -hmm. uh, when there are solutions that folks put on the table, we really try to be intentional about, you know, getting at implementing them. Your opponent talks about how if elected, he would get rid of the chief, Melissa Hyatt. Mm -hmm. That would be one of his first actions. Do you think that's a good idea? And do you still have faith in her abilities? I think the best leaders um, take the time to do a thorough evaluation of every agency and every department. And so I think the first thing I'd say is it's presumptuous for, for me or anyone running to make pronouncements. Um, if I'm fortunate enough to have the opportunity to keep serving, um, every agency, every department head, uh, we'll go through a thorough review and it will not only review what they've done to date, but also whether or not they're the right leader to, to move that agency into the future. So um, I'm, I'm focused, you know, in the meantime, I'm really proud of the progress that the chief and I have delivered on um, safe communities, crime numbers that are down, um, some important reforms across our, our agency. And so, uh, you know, if again, if I'm fortunate enough to be uh, elected again, uh, we'll be doing a full evaluation of all of our department heads, but I think it's presumptuous to, to make any determinations at this point. You're still the county executive right now, though. Do you, have some, yep. do you have faith in her at this moment? Like I said, you know, we are continuing every day to, to work hand in glove to make sure that we are doing whatever we can to support mm -hmm. the men and women of the department, to keep our neighborhood safe, um, and to make sure that we're moving forward on some key critical initiatives. I'm very proud of the work that we're doing together. He also makes a claim that you're not pro-police, mm -hmm. that he, he's the pro-police candidate you're anti-police, defund the police. Do you agree with that? I think the the results don't match the rhetoric. I mean, we've in fact grown the budget by the, by the um, we've, let me try that again. <laughs> uh, we've in fact grown the budget for the police department mm -hmm. by tens of millions of dollars, um, even as we work with um, our budget teams to do significant capital investments in places mm -hmm. like Wilkins and Essex precincts, which are some of the oldest precincts um, in the county and, and most in need of repair or replacement. We're putting significant dollars in for uh, equipment. We are looking at not just the pilot program for take home cars, but yeah. doing more there. So there's more to come. Um, I'm very proud that we continue to support the police department. Uh, my brother uh, is, is a member of the Baltimore County Police Department. I'm so proud of the work that he does, that the other men and women of our agency do. It's critical work. Um, I attend almost every graduation and promotion ceremony to let them know just how important the work is. We're gonna keep investing in them, we're gonna keep listening to them, and keep working with them to make sure we, we continue to make Baltimore County a safe place to live, work, and raise a family. 
You brought up the IG earlier, and that was something that was created. Mm -hmm. um, I've talked to Kelly several times mm -hmm. about what you know her office needs, and <coughs> she's been pushing for expansion. She wants to have more staff so she can do more work. Yep. Um, is that something that you would look at if reelected? Ab absolutely. I mean, I'm very proud to have created the office of the Inspector General. I'm very proud to have expanded it every year I've been in office. Um, and I'm very proud that it's coupled with all of the other reforms that we've done across mm -hmm. across the enterprise. So yeah, I mean, moving forward, we'll continue to have reviews of our budget as we do every year. But to the extent we can, we want to keep investing in that critical work. Um, you know, we have in, in place currently a blue ribbon commission mm -hmm. on ethics and accountability that's looking at ethics more generally um, across our county government and how do we sort of uh, become a best in class jurisdiction, not only um, from an IG perspective, but also just from an ethics perspective, using our ethics panel, mm -hmm. um, trainings, et cetera, to make sure that we are, we are best in class in both serving the public, but also doing so with integrity and honesty um, and that transparency. So um, very proud. I hope that the results of that commission help us not only keep uh, the Inspector General's office successful during my time as county mm -hmm. executive, but the goal is to make sure that it, it long outlives my time and my tenure um, well into the future. Why do you think it's important to have an independent IG within um, county government? You know, look, I think everyone should have accountability. I have accountability to the voters. Um, I think our departments and agencies should have accountability, not just to me, but I think having uh, the opportunity for an outside set of eyes um, to be able to just, you know, hear complaints and, mm -hmm. and run them down is really important. It's an important tenet of, of government to know that, um, what we're doing is done with, again, integrity and professionalism and that it, transparency and accountability. It's, it all sort of uh, sinks together for me towards good governance. And that's something we've been very proud to push since being county executive. I've been at several different news conferences uh, with city leaders and county leaders coming together. Mm -hmm. Do you think that it's important to have that working relationship with leaders in other jurisdictions when it comes to crossover topics yeah. or things that impact people who live and work in both jurisdictions. Yeah, I, I think it's foolish to think we can wall ourselves off mm -hmm. uh, from each other. We are so connected to, in everything that we do, and frankly, we're better when things work well. Um, now, my belief in the region and in regionalism doesn't preclude, um, for example, calling out differences. And I've been very clear, for example, on the water and wastewater issues mm -hmm. that Baltimore County, um, given our role in providing half of operating and, and capital dollars for that system, given the impact it has on our waterways and public health, uh, we have no input or oversight of that system. And I've been pretty clear and persistent that you know Baltimore County deserves a seat at the table and that we need to change the governance structure in a way that is more reflective of that partnership in our region. So how do you do that? Well, it's, it's governed by state law. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, talking to uh, both our partners in the city and also our partners in the legislature to talk about what is happening. Um, and th but this is why I think sometimes you have to be collaborative um, and, you know, being confrontational um, doesn't always get the job done, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes, but also you can't be afraid to also speak truth if you feel like you have to advocate for your residents. So um, I'm always, I always believe in leading with collaboration first uh, but also not being afraid to call out differences. And I think, you know, the, the wastewater system is a perfect example of that. So if reelected, is that something you would like to tackle working with the state, you know, the state representatives in the session um, in the years to come to get that done and to get Baltimore County at the table? Because we know that this is a big <coughs> issue. We saw it come to head and it doesn't sound like the state will be leaving oversight really anytime soon, yeah. so this problem isn't going away. Yeah, and look, this is something that w has been a challenge for, for many years mm -hmm. prior to even the, the mayor's administration. And so I, I actually wanna commend them that there's been a willingness to at least engage in conversation about what that might look like. Um, and so you know, we're gonna keep pushing though until we get to a solution. Uh, but absolutely, it's gonna be a priority of a second term is, is to find an answer um, so that we not only give our residents a fair seat at the table, um, mm -hmm. given, again, its impact on us and our investment, but, but also just getting the system right. Um, and, and because getting it right is good, not just for Baltimore County residents, it's good for the entire region. And so um, that's gonna be one of our, our big priorities uh, moving forward. And uh, you know, I, I'm confident we will, we will get something figured out. Do you think that it's right right now? The current structure? Mm -hmm. No, I, I don't. I mean, I think it's, uh, it's, it's dated. Uh, it, it clearly, um, there have been incidents, whether at the, the Back River yeah. wastewater treatment plant or other instances where 
it's not serving the residents in a way that we deserve and expect. Um, and so, you know, again, for me, not having any, any oversight or control, um, it's hard to know what needs to be changed. But I know that if we're given that opportunity, we can better sort of articulate that and make those changes so that we don't see those kinds of instances happen again. What about transportation and housing? Mm -hmm. Two other topics. Sure. Transportation, we saw uh, the loop. Right, the bus. Yep. How do you see an expansion of the program, or why do you think that's important for residents living in the county? You know, you got to remember this is uh, the county's first ever fixed route transit service that was launched in the middle of a pandemic. Yeah, I uh, remember. You, you couple those two things together, and the fact that we've had over 50,000 riders already is incredible. So the response to the program mm -hmm. has been immense. Uh, I think it speaks to the incredible potential of our communities like. Towson, but, but that can be replicated across Baltimore County. Yeah, I mean, We've created thousands and thousands of jobs at Trade Point Atlantic in Southeast Baltimore County, but moving people around there is critical. We've we got our first ever arts and entertainment uh, designation in Catonsville for, in the county's history. Moving people around those restaurants and mm -hmm. that live music is critical. Um, there's a thriving business community in the Owings Mills Corridor. So there are opportunities in White Marsh and um, Woodlawn and Catonsville and Sparrows Point where we could very easily see some of these types of services replicated. Um, certainly it's important to have a state partner. Uh, the mm -hmm. Towson Loop at this point is pretty much entirely funded operationally out of the county's budget. Um, there's a better partnership from the state and locals and other jurisdictions uh, where the state is actually helping to contribute to that. But we're hoping that the success of the Towson Loop mm -hmm. um, begets the state coming to the table and helping us find ways to do more in other communities with their support. We just heard some news uh, about um, the Trade Point Atlantic area as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. Do you think that that is reflective of the need for more investment in that area and transportation needs um, that could, you know, get the state on board? Yeah, I mean, you know, just just the most recent announcement of a new port terminal right. at, at Trade Point Atlantic is transformational. Um, you're talking about uh, ex expediting environmental remediation of probably one of the most contaminated sites over a thousand ILA labor jobs, high quality, family sustaining wages. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's transformational for a, a community. And so you couple that with all of the other jobs and the fact that there's an entire array of everything from entry level warehousing jobs to um, what will be port related and offshore wind related uh, manufacturing and industry. It's really transformational and it's really incredible. I'm, I'm proud that we're, we've been a big part of it. If you ask TradePoint, um, they would say they couldn't have a better partner than Baltimore County um, in that work. So we actually think we've helped drive some of that. And with that growth mm -hmm. comes required investment. Certainly in transportation, we mentioned maybe having to expand um, micro transit in that, mm -hmm. for that community so that the individuals can get around better. Uh, but also we've partnered with Trade Point. We've got a 25 acre um, state of the art park coming with uh, turf fields and a community center uh, kayak launch, fishing pier, walking paths. Uh, it represents over $20 million of investment that's coming to that community in addition to the jobs and growth that's happening there. Um, so yeah, I mean, new investment's absolutely critical, but we are doing that as mm -hmm. we've also grown opportunities uh, there and across the county. And housing is a bit, you know, has been a topic mm -hmm. in Baltimore County as well as other areas, but how do you view affordable <laughs> housing in the in the county and what's the role of government in that conversation? Yeah, look, I, I think it's attainable housing for me. It's really sort of making sure that people can afford to live um, in, in other com in communities across Baltimore County and the region mm -hmm. um, so that we've got teachers and firefighters who aren't priced out of serving the communities in which they live. Uh, I do think government has to play some role in helping to facilitate that. Um, but I think that you can do that in a way that actually strengthens our communities. And so what we're, what we're focusing on in Baltimore County is finding ways that housing is attainable a little bit everywhere. Mm -hmm. So that if you want to live in a Towson or a Catonsville or a Sparrows Point or Essex or you know, Woodlawn, Randallstown, you can. Um, but that we are stepping away from these fights about um, large scale um, housing projects that are all affordable or attainable and really integrating attainable housing into all that we do. Um, and having it be a little bit everywhere so that individuals actually strengthen um, and benefit both from the community in which they live, but also mm -hmm. add to that vibrancy. So in your mind, it would be a little bit in, in Towson, a little bit here in Catonsville, um, instead of it all kind of focused in one area. Like yeah. we, is that, is that a dated view? Concent yeah, I mean, and the, the, you know, I'm a, you know, the policy mm -hmm. uh, analysis and, the, and the, the academic literature is clear and it's overwhelming. 
concentrated poverty is good for no one. It's not good for an individual, a family, or a community. But we also know that when there is a, a range of experience and you know a diversity of uh, backgrounds in a community, they actually thrive more than a community that's, that's all of the all the same. So you know we we believe in all all forms of diversity and creating opportunity everywhere in a way that doesn't burden any single community. So yeah, I, I very much believe in deconcentrating uh, poverty and giving creating pipelines for opportunity everywhere. And I think it's you know the other piece is it's not just housing, mm -hmm. although I think housing is something that is a fundamental need for all, all people, so we have to find a way to provide it. But we can also couple that with things like workforce development yeah. and jobs so that people can thrive. And then you couple that with things like home ownership programs. So um, someone can go from being a renter to then you know getting a job and becoming a homeowner mm -hmm. and, and sort of contributing. So I think, you know again, if fortunate enough to have a second term, we're really looking at taking those next steps of really connecting people to jobs, but also those job upskilling opportunities for people to really thrive in the years ahead. How important is it to you uh, in order to accomplish some of these goals that we talked about to have partners at the state level mm -hmm. backing you at the same time? You know, to go back to the school construction example, yeah. it's critical. We, we can't do the work that we're doing in Baltimore County without state partnership. Anything of significant scale or substance requires the state to be at the table. And so, you know, I'm very proud of my time in the legislature. I think mm -hmm. we leveraged that very successfully to bring back school construction. Anyone who knows me, you know, you ask, will say, you know, Johnny O, school construction. And that's been our, our mantra, but it's also, you know, when you focus on that and you build the relationship, um, you can really be transformative in, in what you deliver. So um, <clears throat> as we sort of tackle these other challenges and other, other spaces, mm -hmm. we're gonna absolutely ask the state to continue to be at the, continue to be at the table. And uh, you know, I'm really proud that we have a, a history of working well with our state leaders. Um, again, we're, have worked well with um, Governor Hogan mm -hmm. these past four years, and you know, expect that I have a good relationship continuing with the state legislative leaders likely to return and um, the next governor as well. Who do you think that'll be? Westmore. Does it concern you to have Democrats across the top of the ticket um, if Wes is elected? and Dems win the other seats to have a one-party control? Uh, I, I would like to believe that these leaders that we've put up, and I think mm -hmm. I very much believe this, will take the issues as they come, and that um, we will see that, you know, sometimes even Democrats can disagree, and that's okay. Um, I, I think that we, we have put forward some really solid candidates for these offices, and, uh, you know, if, if they are elected to those posts, I look forward to working with them. But if for whatever reason they're not, I've also mm -hmm. proven that I've, I've been very successful working across the aisle. I was elected chairman of the House delegation in Annapolis and a split delegation between Democrats and Republicans unanimously. We've passed uh, tricky legislation locally unanimously with Democrats and Republicans. We've, we've proven that we can work across the aisle to get things mm -hmm. done. I think when you focus on the issues and you bring people together, you can really accomplish almost anything. Looking at these l big goals that you want to, you want to continue mm -hmm. some of the plans. If you're reelected, how soon do you, would you tell the people of Baltimore County that they could expect to see a continuance of what is working well and mm -hmm. some changes to address what's not working? You know, the, the, the nice thing about the transition is that um, we actually have the inaugurations in early December. And so as, as soon as we, uh, again, if we're fortunate enough to be elected, I expect to sort of unveil uh, a plan that sort of builds again on a lot of the successes and that talks about those places where I think we can and should do more, some of which we talked about today, things around workforce, yeah. uh, ensuring uh, quality housing for everyone that's attainable. Um, but, you know, again, I think if you look at the record of both what we've done and how we've done it, and, and I think the how we've done it stands in pretty stark contrast to our opponent, mm -hmm. which is very much more divisive, more rhetoric, uh, more extreme. Um, I think we can we can step into it both already doing the work, but also having the relationships on day one to both continue the, our successes, but also mm -hmm. build on the things that we have to do better in the years ahead. You mentioned evaluations for all the agency heads. Mm -hmm. Do you would you tell them right now that everyone should be expecting to have their job performance looked at and evaluated, and perhaps changes would be made? Yeah, I mean our agency heads know that. Um, just like I have to stand for evaluation before the voters, mm -hmm. um, they, they too will be, be being evaluated in terms of whether or not uh, they're the right leader to move the county ahead. So just because they're in their position now doesn't guarantee they'll stay in it. Every single leader will be evaluated for um, appointment or reappointment as the case might be. Perfect. 
Election Day's coming up. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, appreciate it.